And welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. -on -one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. We're kind of getting right into the middle of summertime. But it's great to be with you and great to have you to study with me the Word of God for the next 30 minutes. I have on the screen there uh, the number if you'd like to sign up for World Bible School. It's one of the best ways we have of studying the Bible really in your own home at your own pace whenever you get ready. So you can call that number or go online and and sign up for World Bible. It's free of charge, and there are about seven lessons. And when you finish those lessons, one at a time, whenever you get ready. But when you start, please finish, because you'll, you'll not really get the full benefit of this study until you uh, complete all of the lessons. And then after that, you get a certificate. And if you would like to study further, we have advanced courses that so many are signing up for. So if you have that uh, interest, I hope you do. You wouldn't or you wouldn't be watching Abundant Living. Uh, last Sunday I closed out a series of lessons on church growth with the uh, Lone Cedar Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama. I went four Wednesday nights in April and then last Sunday we had Bring a Friend Day and Family Day, a big crowd. I had to put out chairs and preachers like that, you know, and, but I uh, met some wonderful people. And we had so much in common. Some of them had known some of the Mayfair members, and, uh, and we had, uh, I had an opportunity of meeting so many people who've been watching Abundant Living. You see, I didn't, I didn't get that when I was at Mayfair every Sunday, but now I'm on the road. Now that I'm uh, visiting congregations just about every Sunday, then I get an opportunity of hearing stories about the program. A man and his wife came back to the Lord Sunday, last Sunday, and, and I think our study on Sunday morning had a lot to do with it because they watched the program. They have been watching it for a long time. So it's really been a real blessing to be able to come into your home on Sunday morning. And so many of them told me last Sunday, they, of course, they're at church at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So they tape the program and watch it on Sunday afternoon. And I appreciate that so much. It's a, a wonderful blessing. Uh, the Mayfair Church has been paying for this program since uh, we're coming up on 40 years. May the 15th of uh, this year, uh, really, we'll start our 40th year. We'll not finish it until 2020 because we started in 1980. So, uh, so many of you have been watching it for years, and I appreciate it. And a special blessing goes out to those in that area that I met this week, uh, last week, um, and who watched the program, and uh, they can't go to worship like they did. And so this is kind of their time to be with the Lord, and that makes it more special. I'll be in North Carolina week after next, but I'll be there on the weekend. And uh, there's a small congregation about 25 miles west of Asheville, and they're the only Church of Christ in that county, and they have about 50 members. And so they've asked me to come up and help them on Friday night and Saturday morning. We'll talk about closing the back door, and then Sunday morning on opening the front door. That's what we're doing, because I truly believe that healthy churches grow. If a church doesn't grow, it's not healthy. There's something wrong spiritually and physically and emotionally. And so that's, that's where we are right now. And so I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate your encouragement. It's always a joy to be able to speak to you. Uh, a man came up to me at the mall the other night and said, 
Uh, I couldn't believe you've never had a traffic ticket. I told him I didn't know why I told that story, but I did. And, uh, but we had a big laugh over it. And so thank you for watching. Now I want you to get your Bible because we're going through the New Testament books and uh, we're pointing out some of the highlights. I, can't, I don't have the time, and if I did, we never would get through, but we're, I'm going through it like I've read the book of Colossians over and over and over again, and uh, I'm going back through then. We gave an introduction last week when we talked about this city was about 100 miles from Ephesus. It was near Laodicea. It's mentioned in the fourth chapter, the church at Laodicea. Colossae had been inundated with some unfortunate doctrine, some philosophies and some um, Gnosticism. Uh, the, the basic attitude was that, that a few of the people uh, were able to be especially spiritual because they were able to uh, understand the the mysteries and the and the knowledge that nobody else had. They were able to be. They were the elite. They would think of themselves in the church, and so Paul writes the book of Colossians and says, "Christ is all you need." In fact, chapter one it talks about Christ has the preeminence. In one translation, I think it's American Standard Version says. Uh, that he's number one. If somebody has the preeminence, they have first place. And that's what the Bible talks about when, because there were so many false teachers back then saying that Christ was not the, that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. And now even today we're hearing that again, that he may be one, but he's just one of many. And if you want to believe that, that's all right with you, but don't bother me with it. I think I hear that just about as much as I hear anything right now. So the book, of, the book of Colossians is extremely important. It's a difficult book because chapters 1 and 2 talks about the preeminence of Christ, that He must be number one, that He is, at, like in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things are created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. And so chapter 1 talks about the preeminence of Christ. Chapter 2 talks about its uh, argument against these false teachers and the false doctrine of Gnosticism, asceticism, uh, extra spiritualism that uh, a few in the church were able to uh, master themselves and understand the mysteries and the, and the attitudes of the day. But then in chapter 3, it's kind of like in Ephesians. This is a copy, uh, a, a cousin, I should say, to the book of Ephesians. It's very similar because in the book of Ephesians you have chapters 1, 2, and 3, which is extremely uh, doctrinal in its context. And then 4, 5, and 6 is also helpful in daily living. Now this is what the same writer in the same prison does to the book of Colossians. Colossians began with chapter 3, since we've dealt with doctrine, since we have said He's the head of the church, all things were made by Him and through Him, and there was not anything made that, uh, the, uh, that has not been made by Him, in verse 18. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is among the dead. He is, from first, he is the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He may have the supremacy, in this translation, preeminence in another translation, first place in another translation. You know, this has been the story since Matthew 6, 33, where Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom. Well, we know what that is, a king and a kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom, the church, and everything the Lord stands for. If He's the head of it, and we need to talk about that because so many uh, believe, unfortunately, that others are the heads of the church. No, Christ is the only head of the church, the only one that's 
ever been and ever will be the head of the church. And therefore, the body must do what the head says to do. And so, uh, this chapter 1 is very important that we understand the position that Jesus had, and that is, He must come first. Matthew 6, 33, again, Seek ye first the kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, that was written in a context of food, clothing, and shelter. He said, Why are you worrying? Why are you worrying about what you're going to eat, and what you're going to wear, and where you're going to live? If you'll put me first, I'll see that you're taken care of. I'll see that you have not what you want, but what you need. And so we must go back to these promises from the Lord from time to time. But let's begin in our time this morning with the third chapter, and I'll try to move along, but you can see there is so much uh, valuable information here that we could just spend a lot of time. Chapter 3, verse 1, Since then, since then, always remember these connecting statements, uh, therefore, because of. In other words, because of what's been said, since he must have first place, he must have the preeminence, that he is the fullness of God. In other words, there's a container of God, and Jesus Christ fills up that container. And that's a statement that's made over and over again, the fullness of God that that's Jesus, not some of you in the church, not some of you who think that you have arrived at your spiritual level. The Bible's always talking about growing in your faith. Nobody has arrived. Uh, and so, therefore, we, we put away things and we put on things, and he talks about this here. I love this. This has always been one of my favorites. He says here, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Well, when, when were you raised? When you died. You can't raise something that hasn't died. And so, what's he talking about here? He's talking about when you became a Christian, since you've been raised with Christ. Now, couple this with Romans chapter 6, when he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How that we who are dead to sin live any longer therein. So then when we die, when we repent, when we turn our lives around, like the prodigal son, when we come to our senses, Luke 15 and verse 17, the prodigal son in the hog pens, the Bible says he came to his senses. He says, basically, this is crazy. I, I, I'm so hungry, I'll, I would gladly eat what I'm feeding the pigs. I'll arise and go to my father's house. That's what a person does when they come to their senses, when they're not blinded by Satan, when they're not blinded by uh, false teaching, when they're not blinded by listening to men rather than listening to God. And so he says, since then, or because of, you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above. Wow. Uh, now, wait a minute, Paul. Y you, you mean, I've got to do this? That's right. You mean, that's part of Christian living? That's correct. Since you've been raised with Christ, you've died to the practice of sin, you've been buried with Him in baptism, and you're raised to walk in newness of life. Now what? That's what I shared with the church last Sunday at, uh, at Lone Cedar. The, the, the worst thing we can do is to teach somebody and then teach them and baptize them and just leave them and, and let them flounder on their own. That's not what the Great Commission says. In Matthew 28 says, go make disciples. That's one thing. And then in verse 19, teaching them, who? The disciples. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And so then I go, I baptize, and I teach. That's the process. If you don't teach, they won't remain faithful. And so since Paul says, since you've completed, since you, we could put it this way, since you become a child of God, since you have given your life to Christ, set your heart 
hearts on things above. Notice he's talking about hearts here. He's talking about minds here. The hearts here is the emotions. It's this, not the blood pump. I guess you could say it's this. It, it's your emotions. It's, uh, it's, it's what you really want. It's what you really, it's where your passion is. And, I, and in these church growth workshops, I talk a lot about passion. Somebody asked me the other day, how do you get people to work in the church? Find out what their passion is. Find out what they enjoy doing. We have too many people trying to do things they don't enjoy doing. And so we need to set our hearts, set your emotions. The Bible talks a lot about emotions. It talks a lot about thinking too, because that's what he says next. But he says, set your hearts on things above. Now, we know what that is, uh, above and below. You know, the Jews considered three heavens. Uh, one heaven was where God is. The third heaven is where the moon and the stars are. The second heaven. The third heaven is the place where the birds fly and airplanes fly. And so when we think about things that are above, and then he goes on to say where Christ is. Okay, now you, I've got it. Seated at the right hand of God. Now, when did this take place? This took place back in Acts chapter 1 when he's talking about the ascension. The Lord appeared to these people and he told them that, uh, that, that in like manner, as you see me ascending into heaven, you shall see me descend back to the earth, back, back down to, the, to get those that have obeyed the gospel, not to the earth because it'll be burned up but back into the Lord where in 1 Thessalonians 4 they shall be, that we shall be called to meet Him in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, where is the Lord? He's at the right hand of God. And so that's the reason when we pray, the book of Romans chapter 8 says He intercedes for us. He takes our prayers and puts them in an acceptable manner and presents them to the Father. Seek the things that are above. Uh, well, let's go ahead because there's so much here. He says, uh, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Set your mind. We're talking about above, but we're talking about spiritual things. And I keep asking the question everywhere I go, how many of us are involved with somebody else spiritually? I know we can play golf with them. We can go shopping with them. We can eat, go to dinner with them. We can have them over for company. We can talk about football or whatever. But how many of us ever get around to a spiritual conversation? Uh, I had a friend that asked me a number of years ago, how's your life spiritually? And that was quite an entry, but we were getting ready to play golf. And I told him, I wish you wouldn't ask me that just before we get ready to play golf. I don't play golf well. So I, I thought that that's very, the very idea of him asking the preacher, how's your life spiritually? But I needed that question, and I need it every day. And that's what we need to ask ourselves. Are we drifting? Uh, are we compromising? Um <clears throat> Are, are we slipping in our faith? You remember me telling you about the fellow that said he, he was just stagnated spiritually. And he said, I, I guess I just don't love the Lord enough. And I said, no, you don't realize how much the Lord loves you. And when we realize how much people and the Lord loves us, that ought to cause us to want to live right and do right. So I love these two areas. Set your hearts on things that are above. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if I'm around you very long, you're going to tell me what's in your heart. Uh, you, you're going to tell me what means the most to you. You're going to tell me your story. And uh, I have made it quite a study of the fact that you cannot not tell your story. 
And so if, uh, you know, if whatever, whatever, are you laying up treasures in heaven, Matthew chapter 6? Are you doing things spiritually? This is what attendance, Bible study, prayer, caring about people, doing good deeds, living for other people, doing for other people instead of yourself. So set your heart on, hearts on things that are above. And then he said, set your mind on things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And he said, for you died. He's kind of uh, reading their mail. He's kind of uh, reaching a conclusion. It's, it's kind of a like, you are going to do right, aren't you? Uh, you did become a Christian, didn't you? Uh, you? You have been baptized, haven't you? I thought you died to sin. See, when something dies, you bury it. You don't keep doing it. You don't keep using it. It's no good when it dies. And he says here, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, oh my, You see his argument here. He didn't start out fussing. He didn't start out condemning. He started out by trying to reason. That, that's, that's what I love about Paul. He, he was such a logical person that he would want to reason with people. Okay, since then you have been raised with Christ. I want you to put your heart and I want to put your mind your mind, I used to see on television this commercial, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And so he wants both. He wants your mind and your emotion. You see, I, I, when I'm teaching about grief, I, I try to illustrate it like this, that when something terrible happens, our emotion, our heart gets way out here. And our mind is back here. And so as time goes on and as we get help, as we share... I always say pain and grief that's shared is cut in half. And so as things begin to settle down, the mind catches up with the heart. Most people, unfortunately, live totally on their feelings. And that's our culture today. Our culture today is how do you feel, not how much do you know. We've gone from subjective to objective. Excuse me. We've gone from objective, in other words, what do you know? What do you know cognitively? I know better, but my heart tells me to do this. And so people li live today out of how they feel. Well, I, I, I don't want my marriage anymore. I don't feel like uh, I did before. I don't like this church because I don't feel. Let's use our logic. The Bible uses both, but they must work in conjunction with each other. I think when we do right, we feel right. When I do the right thing, then I feel the right thing. And that's true in the book of Acts. When you look at the ones who were converted, it was the ones who asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And when they were told they did it, they went away rejoicing. They didn't rejoice before then. Uh, the people on Pentecost interrupted Peter's sermon and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent <clears throat> and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And they that gladly received his word were baptized in that day about 3,000 souls. And so then feelings are fine if they're followed by doing. I feel better after I clean out the garage. I feel better after I do what I'm supposed to do. And so feelings are fine, but they shouldn't be the only emotion that we have. We should be able to think through things. And the Bible primarily, uh, that's what Paul said in Philippians, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Uh, the Lord, you know, when you become a Christian, you don't throw your mind away. 
you, you start studying, like Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that uh, believeth not shall be condemned. And so, we need to think these things through. And so, you can see how much meat, how much help is in this area. What's the matter with my life? I'm too earthly minded. I, I'm too, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm too consume with things. And he says, set your hearts on things that are above. Start thinking about the Lord. Start thinking about how brief life is. Start thinking about the fact that uh, there will be a judgment and there will be an eternity. Start thinking about things that are above are the things that are heavenly. And then he says, set your mind there. And if you died, if you quit it, then, <clears throat> and your life is hidden in Christ. That's, a, that's an interesting word. Your life is hidden in Christ. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, <clears throat> for me to live is Christ. If you want to look at Christ, look at me. Ooh, boy, I don't believe I can say that. Paul said he could. In Galatians 2.20 he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. The point he's making there is, I try to produce the life of Christ every day in my life. Do I do it? Probably not. Do I try to do it? Yes, I do. Am I trying to do better? Yes, I am. Do I ask the Lord for help? I certainly do. Well, again, <clears throat> these things are so deep. And, and Colossians is such a deep letter. You just can't read it at night and turn over and go to sleep. You need to get chapters 1 and 2 where Jesus said, I am number one. That Christ, Paul says, Christ says, P Paul says Christ is number one. And though, so since He is, why don't you live for Him? And why don't you practice what He was willing to die for? Well, next Sunday, Lord willing, is Mother's Day. And uh, my mother, who's passed away, of course, would not allow me to talk with you on Sunday morning on Mother's Day about something else. So we'll have a special lesson on Mother's Day. Until next week, may God bless you, is our prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ, a place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord.